All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, first, let me uh, say good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, rather, and uh, thank you all on behalf of the Morehouse School of Medicine and the Satcher Health Leadership Institute uh, for joining us for today's special webinar series. I'm Daniel Dawes. I'm the Executive Director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to our webinar where we're going to be discussing how we can empower HBCUs and vulnerable populations to lead environmental equity actions. Environmental health equity and climate justice uh, are concepts that acknowledge the unequal burden of environmentally attributed negative health and social outcomes that disproportionately impact under-resourced, vulnerable, and marginalized communities. At the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, we continue to inform efforts, inform policy and advocacy through a health equity lens and we're advocating for fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of their race, their color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, the implementation, and the enforcement of our environmental laws, regulations, and other policies. This program recognizes that the environmental community has not always been inclusive or worked in ways that pr prioritize the health and well being of communities of color and other marginalized populations. So our institute is working to expand our work by partnering with and empowering vulnerable communities who have borne the brunt of our nation's pollution and climate change impacts, to name a few. Our aim today is to contribute to developing actionable solutions for the climate crisis, among additional environmental factors that are continuing to cause undue burdens on those already vastly challenged populations. Today's convening is going to include local, state, and federal policymakers, as well as health professionals, environmental health experts, public health professionals, and community leaders to discuss solutions and equitable outcomes in historically black colleges and universities surrounding health and climate change impacts to our communities. Before we begin, let me just uh, quickly thank our nationally renowned experts from distinguished institutions who are presenting today for their insights on this very important topic. Let me also give a special and warm welcome to our Georgia State Representative, uh, the Honorable Mandisha Thomas, and of course, uh, to the Honorable Dr. Carlton Waterhouse from the US Environmental Protection Agency. And lastly, I just wanna thank the Environmental Defense Fund for their collaborative partnership over the last year and a half, for their generous support of this initiative, because without them, we wouldn't have this event. And again, let me thank all of you. And we are looking forward to advancing strategies and partnerships that tackle the disproportionate impact that the climate crisis and environmental injustices are having on our community, especially communities of color. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your tireless advocacy as we try to move this needle of health equity forward. Now it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Maisha Standifer, who serves as our health policy director at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. And she will also serve as the moderator for this series. Dr. Standifer. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Daniel. Again, we welcome all attendees to the series, and we thank those who are presenting this afternoon. Before we start, there are a few virtual housekeeping requests and announcements. Number one, this discussion is being recorded, and we ask that all participants remain throughout the duration of this event. And for those attendees who have questions, please do not hesitate to type in your questions uh, during the Q&A segment of the event following all presentations. We will attempt to respond to all questions within the allotted time frame. Now let's begin. It is with pleasure that we are honored to have distinguished guests with us today, along with our scholars. Let's first welcome the Honorable Georgia State Representative Mandisha Thomas of the 65th District. Greetings, thank you. Good afternoon. So greetings, thank you. I'm State Representative Mandisha Thomas of the 65th District House of Representatives. Uh, I cover six cities and actually two counties, and that is Palmetto, Chattahoochee Hills, Douglasville, Fairburn, City of South Fulton, 
And um, I am very passionate about environment and agriculture. I actually ran on those items and I'm actually working on those items in legislation as um, a freshman legislator. So I've only been in office uh, for eight months. Um, I understand that there is a severe environmental injustice problem um, in basically every city below I-20 which is about eight cities and I have jurisdiction in five of those eight cities. So District 65 is a holds a lot of power and authority when it comes to our communities and dealing with the environmental justice, the food insecurities. Um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons um, I ran for office is because I see what it's doing in our communities. Um, I see the raw sewage running through our Chattahoochee River creeks. I see the tractor trailers coming in and out of our communities with the exhaust that's bringing in toxins into our homes. I see the warehouses being built in the back of our homes with no bordery lines. Um, we don't know what type of toxins are in the products that are being made in these warehouses that are seeping into our homes that can exacerbate cancer and asthma or any other unwanted uh, disease. I also know that we are, are expected to compete on a global and a national level. So when I think about our youth, I'm wondering how will they be able to compete on a national and global level when they're not getting the proper nutrition to their brains to even think on the national and global level because the toxins in the air are killing the pollinations that the farmers need to grow the fresh fruits and vegetables um, that they're growing in on their farms. Also, I see that there's a need to get our fresh fruits and vegetables into our school systems. Our children should be eating, for, eating out of the gardens and the, the farms that are in right here in our community. And we talk about HBCUs. I'm a product of the HBCU, Gramlin State University. And so I'm here fighting on behalf of, of our communities for environmental justice and agriculture. And what I've promised to do is to make people aware. So my prime focus is for education and awareness. And what I've done in that vein is to hold the Georgia Environmental Justice Education and Awareness Symposium that I do every year. I've also started an environmental boot camp which is a five-week course teaching individuals on solar energy, teaching them on landfills, recycling, agriculture, and just making sure that they're becoming advocates in their community. I found out once people are aware of what's going on, they want to get involved. And so in October, which is in support of Agribusiness Month, I'm going to be doing a agribusiness tour for South Fulton County. And what I'm doing is encouraging the 180 state representatives or 179 other state representatives that serve with me to get on board to start moving in this vein. Uh, it, it's unbelievable, and I am a Democrat, but it's unbelievable that we are not addressing the environmental injustices like I think we should on a state level. House Bill 432, uh, Representative Drenner was the author of that bill. It, it was a simple bill to invoke an environmental commission. We couldn't get the votes. When we recognize that there is an environmental problem, we have a natural resource and environment state committee, both on the House and the Senate side, but we can't get an environmental commission bill passed. So these are things that I am just working so hard um, to make sure that uh, we can get the resources that we need um, in environmental justice. And I'm coupling that with agriculture because I feel like you can't talk about environment without talking about agriculture. So one thing that I was able to do as a freshman legislator was to get some monies out of the state bu budget for the Young Georgia Farmers Association program. And that brings an individual that is dedicated to my district, but that can help the entire state of Georgia in resources and grants and technical assistance. It can help municipalities and environmental consulting. And this was a mere $85,000 funded position where the state would fund 70% and Fulton County Schools would fund 30%. It was extremely difficult to get this money, extremely to get difficult to get $85,000. But in turn, this $85,000 
in turn turns out to $2.5 million over the next three years and all was going to be done. And what I have is Mr. Travis Hyman, who is the young farmer, sitting with me here today. And I would like him to, to just give you some words on how we're working in the community with agriculture and environment. All right, good morning everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Representative Thomas, um, like I said, my name is Travis Hyman, representing South Fulton Young Farmers Association, um, which what we're, what we're doing is we're educating the community on the importance of agriculture through adult through an adult education program. We have a series of about 25 courses that we'll be offering to the community. Everything from fall gardening, spring gardening, herbal gardening, um, poultry production, um, beekeeping, rape, um, growing your own food, wellness, um, raised bed 101 is one of our courses. We're offering all these courses to the South Fulton community. You don't actually have to be in this area to be a part of what we're doing. Um, if you would like information, you can email me, um, Hyman, H-Y-M-A-N-T at FultonSchools.org. We're actually having our first adult program course tomorrow, and then we'll be having two next month. If you're interested in learning more about agriculture and the environment, please reach out to me. We're providing technical assistance as well to any of the people in this area that would that want to learn how to grow their own food and just learn best practices on environment and agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyman. I'm, I'm glad that he was able to come on um, with me today to show you how we're working and what is influencing our communities. I'm just excited to be here and I thank you so much for having me on. Um, it's just a lot of work to do and I'm pressing forward to do that. If anyone is interested in working with me on any environmental or agricultural issues, please contact me at mandisha.thomas at house.ga.gov. Um, just to let you know, a few of my colleagues are working diligently with EPA, and we're so excited to have um, Michael Regan as the new EPA director. We have a call with him coming up shortly where we're going to be um, discussing with him the needs of uh, our water supply, coal ash, and some of the higher climate issues uh, that are going on in the state of Georgia. And so once we have that call, I can report back to you, uh, Dr. Mayshaw, on that as well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Representative Thomas. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, to uh, read your bio. I wanted to, uh, you jumped in so fast. So I did want to highlight that you may be a freshman representative, but you are uh, definitely experienced by working under U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi campaign, uh, Nancy Pelosi's campaign for the California General Assembly. Uh, your experience has allowed you to get more expertise, especially as a legislative aide for the Georgia General Assembly and a key member behind the South Fulton City uh, efforts for expansion of uh, consumer affairs, industry labor, information and audits committee. So we thank you again and as a great product of Grambling State University, we are so excited that you were able to join us today. Also, I just wanted to highlight, I believe you did briefly, but you are the founder of the Georgia Environmental Justice Education and Awareness Symposium, the Apple Day Mobile Unit Health Fair of Georgia, and the 2021 Intellectual Summit of South Fulton County. Thank you again, Representative Thomas. I now have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Carlton Waterhouse. Dr. Colton Waterhouse currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Administrator for EPA's Office of Land and Emergency Management after being appointed by the Biden administration in February 2021. Dr. Waterhouse is an international expert on environmental law and environmental justice and has lectured globally on climate justice and group-based inequality. Dr. Waterhouse began his legal career as an attorney with the EPA, where he served in the Office of Regional Counsel in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Office of General Counsel in Washington, DC. He serves as the chief counsel for the agency in several significant cases, and as a national and regional expert on environmental justice, earning three of the agency's prestigious national awards. Before rejoining the EPA in 2021, he held an appointment as a professor of law at the Howard University School of Law, 
where he was building the school's Environmental Justice Center. Prior to joining the Howard Law faculty in 2019, he held an appointment as a professor of law at the Indiana University Robert McKinney School of Law, where he directed the Environmental Energy and Natural Resources Law Program. Let's welcome Dr. Carlton Waterhouse. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? I have some background noise I'm trying to keep out. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. If, if not, yes, let we me can know. hear you. Okay, wonderful. So thanks so much for, again for that kind introduction and thanks so much for this opportunity to be with you all on today. Uh, my name is Carlton Waterhouse has been said and I am the Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Office of Land and Emergency Management uh, and the Senate nominee by President Biden to head the Office of Land and Emergency Management at U the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I can't go further without taking some time to do a few shout outs. I have to thank and shout out Representative Tavita Thomas for all of her hard work and efforts in this area. It's clear that even though she's not, a, even though she's a freshman, she is clearly a senior uh, ahead of many of her colleagues in moving forward this agenda. And we wanna recognize and thank her for all of those important efforts that she's making and the way that she's moving the ball for the state of Georgia. I also need to take time to say hello and to acknowledge and recognize my fellow sojourner on the path to environmental justice and NEJAC member, Dr. Osborne Jelks. It's wonderful to see you here today uh, and always to share a panel with you. Additionally, I need to recognize that I'm at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And so I'm in the house of Dr. Victor Blake, who I call my doctor for my long time um, there in Atlanta for 14 years where I had much uh, many interactions with Morehouse and the School of Medicine. And then also my longtime A&E colleague, Dr. Marvin Crawford as well. Uh, so those shout outs having been uh, made, I want to just share my enthusiasm to be with you all today to collaborate with the Morehouse School of Medicine and other health professionals in connecting on the issue of the environment more broadly and to specifically talk about environmental justice and health. Uh, as you know, the um, struggle for environmental justice is entirely about uh, guaranteeing health and well being for uh, millions of Americans and people around the world who find themselves burdened with higher levels of pollution uh, and adverse health impacts that are related to their social identity, you know, in particular, their socioeconomic status, their ethnicity, their race. Uh, and as we get outside of the, sh the boundaries of the US, we find religion, clan, tribe, identity, region, all those playing a large role. Uh, but as we break this down to look at this matter from the standpoint of healthcare professionals, uh, it's really critical uh, that we acknowledge that healthcare professionals of all levels are really the key partners and allies for communities that are facing environmental challenges, and especially those who are dealing with environmental injustices. It's exactly the institutions like this one at Morehouse School of Medicine that produces the medical leaders who can help address community health challenges and serve as allies for communities of color and low-income populations in the U.S. who are often experiencing more environmental stressors and burdens uh, and the healthcare challenges that flow from them. Environmental justice uh, is really about health, as we've said. And as we move forward in our thinking about how to best protect uh, the communities that we serve, it's critical that we're mindful of health outcomes and health impact data that's available to help us do a better job of understanding and protecting these communities. In the US, there's ample evidence that racial and ethnic uh, minority groups and low-income populations uh, all have greater exposure to pollution, such as particulate matter, uh, ground level ozone, lead, uh, and carcinogens from chemical plants. We also know that in addition to greater exposure to pollution, these populations have disproportionately higher exposure to other conditions um, like inadequate access to healthcare, food deserts, a lack of economic opportunities, poor housing, uh, and, and other issues that then complicate and further um, produce additional stressors for them on their health. 
So the development of closer ties to medical and public health institutions really enable us to better utilize the data we have for purposes related to identifying and then addressing these enhanced vulnerabilities that members of some communities face. And we use this information to better understand the impacts that exposures to contaminants and other stressors might have on these populations and thereby helping us to find better ways to protect these people. As you can see, environmental justice is clearly a health concern. And some of these concerns fall under the rubric of traditional medical concerns, such as the impacts and effects of toxics and pollution on the body. Uh, and we know that the traditional medical health impacts can range from as basic uh, reactions as those that are gonna be allergic uh, and skin related to those that can be as um, ultimately damaging as cancer and genetic damage. Now, one of the issues that I have spent a lot of time working on in recent years, I wanna take a little more time to talk about uh, is lead. You know, lead is a toxic substance that affects the nervous system and exposures can have profound adverse impacts on childbearing children and on children themselves. And the idea of lead, or rather the, the issue with lead is not a new one. We've understood for some time that lead is a horrible debilitating um, substance when in the human body, and particularly for those who are children because of its impact on their neurological development. Uh, it produces horrible um, biological effects, some of which can carry on into future generations. And so we also know historically that the EPA recognized going back to 1992 in his first environmental equity report um, that lead is one of the unique contaminants that we have had good data to show that there are substantial racial disparities in terms of those who suffer from lead. My experience with lead most recently relates back to my time in Indianapolis when I was working with community advocates to try to address the inadequate amount of lead, uh, blood lead poisoning that was being done in terms of sampling protocols by the state. Uh, and that ultimately carried on to work at the Environmental Justice Center at Howard University, where students and I worked together to produce a 50 state led survey, a research project to identify what programs were in place by different jurisdictions to provide protect, protection to their citizens and particularly to their children from lead. The lead work uh, that I started continues now at the EPA in a different form. So I've been asked and I'm leading the agency's lead strategy team. And that team is designed to break down solos across silos across the agency so that we work across our programs to reduce um, these horrible impacts that lead uh, can have. And so there's great amount of attention to removing lead service lines, to addressing lead at Superfund sites, to addressing lead in consumer homes where the agency has authority, but more so outside of the agency's authority, we're working across the federal government to have a one government approach, a whole of government approach to address the concerns of lead. And in particular, we've been working closely with, the, um, with HUD to develop a collaborative response strategy pilot program that will call people to come together across federal and state agencies uh, in coordination with different parts of HHS, Health and Human Services, to provide a robust way to address sites that have lead as a contaminant of concern where Superfund is in charge of doing a, a cleanup. And so we're really excited about the way we're working within the agency to try to address this environmental justice concern and we really look forward to having ongoing communications with you all and other stakeholders as we develop that policy. As you know, in the time of COVID, we're all mindful of the many stressors and challenges that we're facing, but people who are in overburdened and underserved communities have particular vulnerabilities and numerous pre-existing conditions that they face. And these complicate their vulnerability to 
that virus and other problems. As a result, it's so critical that we together are today talking about environmental justice and health. And I'm so excited to be with you all and I'm very grateful that you all are doing this on today. Thank you again, Dr. Waterhouse. And thank you again, Representative Thomas. We, are, we here at SHLI are working alongside all policymakers, organizations, stakeholders, and community entities to advance the efforts towards mitigating climate effects, environmental injustices for the present and future generations, not just here in Georgia, but throughout the nation. So let's proceed with presentations from our specialized scholars representing just a few of the most distinguished, highly honorable, historically black colleges and universities with expertise ranging from water safety, urban land renewal, agriculture, marine ecosystems, to energy renewal and security. Hailing from the preeminent, preeminent and most prestigious higher education institutions in the United States, we have representing from here in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Atlanta University Center from Spelman College, Dr. Fatima Shafi, Dr. Nataki Jokes, and Dr. Ethel Bering from Morehouse College as well. And I will read their bios, and if they could come in that order after reading their bios, I'd greatly appreciate it. We'd first like to start with Dr. Fatima Shafi. She is an associate professor of political science and director of the environmental studies at Spelman College. She also serves as co-chair of Sustainable Spelman Community. Dr. Shafi served as a member of the US EPA National Education Justice Advisory Council from 2012 to 2018. She is co-founder of the Greater Atlanta Regional Center of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development officially acknowledged in 2017 by the United Nations University. She has served as an environmental justice consultant for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Dr. Shafi has served as an invited speaker, panelist, chair, and panel organizer for various conferences and forums. Dr. Shafi has successfully secured several federally funded grants from the US EPA, UNCF Mellon Program for her research in environmental policy and education, areas and has served as the principal investigator for several projects. Following Dr. Shafi, we'll have Dr. Nataki Jokes. Dr. Jokes is an assistant professor in the environmental health sciences program at Spelman College. Dr. Jokes investigates urban environmental health disparities, the role, the place, space, and race playing, in, playing factors influencing uh, some of the health including cumulative, cumulative risk assessment, the impact of climate change on vulnerable populations, and the connection between urban watersheds, pollution, built environment, and health. She also develops, implements, and evaluates community-based initiatives that set conditions to enable low-income and communities of color to empower themselves to reduce exposure to environmental health hazards and improve health and the quality of life. Dr. Jokes is particularly interested in approaches that engage environmentally overburdened communities and monitoring local environmental conditions, generating actionable data for community change and developing effective community-based interventions that revitalize toxic degraded spaces into health, healthy places. Dr. Jokes co-founded the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, a community-based environmental justice organization that works to grow a cleaner, greener, and healthier, sustainable West Atlanta through authentic community engagement, organizing, education, and community science. Following Dr. Jelks, we will have Dr. Ethel Vereen. Dr. Vereen is an assistant professor of biology at Morehouse College with a STEM education focus on diversity and inclusion in natural resources and a research focus on environmental health, water quality, and environmental microbiology. Dr. Vereen was recently awarded a 300,000 Research Initiation Award from the National Science Foundation for his current project. And that is metagenomic approaches to assess water quality and microbial load variability of an urban watershed. 
This has increased the research capacity at Morehouse College and provides additional training opportunities for the college's STEM students. He currently serves on several boards and foundations, including the board for the Environmental Leadership Program, NSF NEON Technical Working Group, and his exemplary condition, contributions in the areas of undergraduate education, student learning, and campus life. They all have been noted as he was awarded the 2019 Vulcan Teaching Excellence Award and recently recognized as one of 1,000 inspiring Black scientists in America. Now let's welcome professors from Spelman College and Morehouse. We'll start with Dr. Sheffi. If Dr. Shafi is not available at the time, we can start with Dr. Jelks. All right. I see Dr. Shafi is here, so she may be having some technical challenges, but I can go ahead and kick it off. If you bear with me to share my screen. So thank you so much uh, for the, the warm introduction and also thank you uh, for Dr., uh, to Dr. Standiford, Dr. Um, Representative Thomas and her colleague, as well as Dr. Waterhouse. It is um, really an honor to be here today with you all, as well as um, with Dr. Victor Ibanasi. I, I know he hasn't been introduced yet, but uh, definitely he has been a mentor for uh, I won't tell you how many years, but since I was an undergraduate student at Spelman College and he helped to get me engaged in this work. So I want to talk um, as we talk about um, the uh, environmental inequities and uh, the impact of the climate crisis on vulnerable populations. Uh, I want to start off just talking about health effects associated with pollution. And because I'm in Georgia, I thought I would just highlight the fact that Georgia is home to three of the nation's largest uh, dirty coal plants. And when we think about um, pollution coming from coal plants and other sources, um, we have to recognize that there are vulnerable populations within our communities. Um, quite frankly, we are all vulnerable. Uh, but when we think about our children and pregnant women or those trying to become pregnant, uh, as well as those who live uh, and work around these uh, coal burning uh, power plants, they are at highest risk. And I just, I mentioned power plants, but we can think about a number of different types of pollution sources. Uh, Dr. Waterhouse in his comments already mentioned um, the impact, um, that the devastating impact that we've seen with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know uh, that in communities that are impacted by uh, pollution coming from greenhouse gases uh, and other sources that these are, are the communities that have been suffering the most in terms of COVID-19. When we think about the impact to, you know, again, these vulnerable populations, including our children, um, children who are exposed to unsafe levels of pollution can face a lifetime of health impacts. Um, exposure very early, you know, in the womb or in early childhood can lead to a number um, of health, health impacts. Things like stunted lung growth, reduced lung function and capacity, um, increased risk of developing asthma, acute lower respiratory infections. Um, we're also talking about things like impaired mental and motor development, low birth weight, premature uh, birth, um, as well as infant mortality, childhood cancers, and the increased risk of heart disease and diabetes uh, and stroke in adulthood. And while I focus here on children, uh, just keep in mind uh, that there are also impacts to adults um, when we talk about uh, air pollution. But you know, on, on with children again, um, and children are heavy uh, on my mind because um, our children, many of our children have just gone back to 
school. Uh, those who ride the ride school buses might be impacted um, by the diesel pollution from those buses. In some school districts across the country, we've seen some retrofits. And so uh, school buses uh, are using some cleaner fuels in some places, but that's not uh, something that is exclusive uh, or uh, excuse me, inclusive across the country. Uh, some of our communities uh, still have these dirty uh, polluting buses um, that are taking our kids to school. But beyond pollution, uh, climate change also causes other risks. Um, we can think about fossil fuels co uh, combustion and how that's increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And in addition to pollution, this causes hotter temperatures, more intense extreme weather, and rising sea levels. When we think about climate change in connection to health, we know that most of the expected impacts will be adverse, um, but we are expecting to see changes in the frequency and the severity of familiar health risk. Um, from a climate change perspective and from a perspective of human exposures, we've got to think about regional weather changes, heat waves, extreme weather, temperature, as well as increased precipitation. In terms of those health effects, we're looking at temperature-related illnesses and death, extreme weather-related illnesses and death. Um, air pollution related health effects, water and foodborne diseases, vector borne and rodent borne diseases, the effects of both food and water shortages, as well as the, imp uh, the effects um, of population displacement as a result uh, of some of these extreme weather events that we are experiencing. The impact on climate change uh, of climate change on health, um, you know, can also manifest itself in terms of uh, injuries, fatalities, mental health impacts. I don't think we talk about that enough. Um, but when people go through an experience, um, you know, the extreme weather events, um, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, hurricanes, floods, and superstorms, or superstorms, or we're talking about, you know, things like um, the warming that we're seeing out west um, with the wildfires. Um, there is trauma uh, and there are mental health that are mental health impacts that are associated with people experiencing these events. And this is something that we don't talk about quite enough. Um, we do talk about things like cardiovascular failure, um, heat related illnesses and death. Um, you know, when we think about things both domestically as well as all over the world, we're thinking about things like forced migration. Um, malnutrition, in some countries, diarrheal disease. Uh, in some places, we, we have to think about water quality impacts from, um, you know, diseases like cholera. Um, we think about, um, you know, bacteria, crypto, uh, crypt uh, we think about crypto, we think about campylobacter, um, as well as harmful algal blooms. Uh, and then, of course, we also think about respiratory effects, um, as well as um, air pollution, uh, cardiovascular disease, and asthma, uh, and those impacts that are coming uh, from increased vectors uh, in places where we haven't seen them historically, um, you know, be very prevalent. Our health is harmed by climate change, um, and it, it varies by the different geographic regions as we think about the United States or um, across the world. But if we look at the southeast and look at this map, we'll see things like extreme temperatures, uh, outdoor air quality, extreme events, um, you know, mosquito and tick-borne infections, um, as well as water-related infection uh, and mental health and well-being. So these are things that we are currently experiencing and expect to see uh, in, um, in increased, you know, fashion uh, over the years if we are not changing this current trajectory. If we look at Atlanta specifically, where I'm located, uh, and we look at current climate hazards and what we expect by 2050, um, we see increases across the board in terms of precipitation, warming, water deficit, drought, as well as heat waves. And if we connect the dots, thinking about um, the effects of you know, flooding, for instance, and so while Atlanta is not a coastal area, um, we do have a lot of localized flooding and flooding that we're seeing uh, happening because of um, you know, uh, increased precipitation. So when we think about you know, those, uh, the environmental conditions and the hazards that are associated with that flooding, we're thinking about things like contaminated water, uh, waterborne infection, and unfortunately, uh, in some uh, areas of uh, the West side of Atlanta, um, we've had whole communities that have had to be dis, uh, relocated away from, um, you know, the places where they, you know, connected to community and, and had a sense of place um, because their homes were flooded out with sewage laced, you know, contaminated water. 
this um, picture is, is one example of some of the flooding events that we've seen uh, in recent years. While this one is not um, a picture from uh, the city of Atlanta, it's uh, in Mableton, Georgia, right outside of the city. Um, and this was a major flooding event that we saw in 2009. Uh, and we saw uh, other uh, flooding, major flooding events happening in some of the um, areas that were more interior to the city as well. And so as we connect those dots, um, we've talked about, you know, things like flooding. We've talked a little bit about hotter temperatures. Um, but I want to just, you know, re uh, or just emphasize the fact that when we think about air pollution and climate change, there's this sort of cyclical thing happening uh, with hotter conditions. So on one hand, certain types of air pollution are more prevalent when conditions are hotter. So those hotter conditions can increase uh, smog, for instance. Um, drier conditions can increase uh, particulate matter. Um, and then we see pollution from fires, uh, as well as from dust storms in the places where those occur. Um, but, you know, climate change uh, in, in, uh, in part uh, comes from an increase in greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And so those greenhouse gases come from the burning of fossil fuels. They come from polluting industries. And when we have, um, and those polluting industries, um, as well as the pollution that they emit, help to trap heat um, and cause climate change. So you can see how they are all connected um, and we can't easily separate one from the other. So back to Atlanta, um, over the past several years, since 1970, you can see an increase uh, in this uh, graph uh, in terms of more spring days. And these are days that are above normal. We also can see that there have been an increase since 1970 in the days above 90 degrees. With that, we have a longer growing season um, for you know, allergen, uh, for allergen producing um, you know, weeds uh, and vegetation. And so with that longer allergy season, lots of people are impacted. The, the reality is that climate change impacts all of us. We're all in the same storm, but we are not necessarily all in the same boat. Certain communities have been made to be more vulnerable to climate change and to the human health effects that are associated with it. When we think about exposure, we're talking about the contact that people have, um, whether we're talking about hazards or stressors that are biological, um, psychosocial, chemical, or physical in nature. Um, and these include stressors that are affected by climate change change. Certain communities are going to be more sensitive um, because of the vulnerabilities um, that have been produced um, by a history of, um, you know, institutionalized racism in this country. And so not only are certain communities more vulnerable, their ability to adapt to climate change um, is compromised. Um, and we see that manifest itself in a number of health outcomes from injury to acute and chronic illnesses um, to developmental issues and even death. Um, I know I need to wrap up, so let me just kind of quickly say that um, when we think about these climate change impacts, we have to think about the overlapping vulnerabilities that certain communities already face. People in poor neighborhoods are more likely to be exposed to climate change health risk. People with chronic medical conditions are more likely to have a serious problem with respect to some of the impacts of climate change, um, like heat-related events. Um, people And people with reduced access you know, to care and to prevent services are much more likely to have a severe health outcome or illness as it relates to climate change and the overlapping uh, impacts um, of these other factors that cause communities to be vulnerable, uh, inclusive of things like air quality. Um, so just quickly as I wrap up, um, when we think about increased temperature um, and increased carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, that again leads to an increase in smog uh, and ground level ozone, increased allergen production, longer seasons for allergen producing weeds, uh, as well as health effects um, that come from exposure to pollutants like ozone, um, leading to reduced lung function, reduced uh, or respiratory discomfort, as well as the exacerbation of chronic respiratory illnesses. And when we think about those vulnerable populations, not only are we now thinking about um, our uh, pregnant women, and children, and those who want to become pregnant, but we've also got to think about our senior citizens um, and those who are on fixed income who are going to be most vulnerable um, to high levels of ozone as well as increased um, allergens.
Um, back to the South again, um, we know it, you know, as the dirty South because of the number of um, environmental hazards and stressors. And Dr. Robert Bullard said that the South has a history of unequal protection. Why would the environment be any different? In 2012, there was a study published by um, a nonprofit law firm called Green Law um, called the Patterns of Pollution. This looked at demographics and pollution in metropolitan Atlanta. And so um, we were found to have over 52 um, environmental justice hotspots in a 14 county metropolitan Atlanta area. And these hotspots are places where you have multiple pollution sources, um, but you also have social vulnerability, um, communities that are low income, communities of color, as well as language isolated communities. And you see these hot spots identified in the red. The blue boxes here on the map are the cold spots. Um, so these are places with multiple pollution sources, but um, not as much social vulnerability. I'll end in just briefly mentioning the urban heat island. Again, when we talk about pollution and the warming, it's all connected. Um, and so we also, um, not only do we have to be concerned about greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, but we also have to look at the state of development, especially in our densely populated urban centers. On this urban heat island profile, you'll see um, that temperatures are higher in those districts that are um, perhaps downtown, perhaps commercial districts where there is a lot more development uh, and where there is asphalt, blacktop, um, and other heat trapping surfaces versus areas that are going to have more trees, parks, green space, um, and a protective tree canopy. Heat waves um, impact, um, again, these populations who are most vulnerable. Um, folks who don't have access to air conditioning, people who may not be able to afford it, uh, or who don't run it um, because of high energy burden. Um, and, and those populations, you know, include the elderly um, and, you know, or other senior citizens, low socioeconomic populations, um, and those who already are suffering from different types of chronic health conditions. Uh, in Atlanta, Spelman is partnering with Georgia Tech um, and the city of Atlanta and community-based organizations like the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance to lead a study called Urban Heat ATL, where we are exploring extreme heat um, in the city of Atlanta and we're mapping urban heat islands. We are doing that um, using pocket lab temperature sensors um, in which Spelman students as well as Georgia Tech students and, and community members are mapping temperature across a number of neighborhoods. Spelman is also leading the Atlanta Heat Watch campaign, um, which is funded by NOAA, and we have a one day um, a data collection uh, campaign coming up on September the 4th in which we are reaching out uh, to anybody who's in the Atlanta to help us, uh, Atlanta area, to help us to drive around um, to different locations across the city um, to map temperature using uh, temperature sensors that will be mounted to your vehicle. Um, we have incentives for participation and I can put the link in the chat. We're still looking for volunteers um, to help us. This is Labor Day weekend, but it will give us an idea of a one day snapshot of what temperature is looking like across various um, communities uh, in the Atlanta region. And we will then um, try and angulate that data with other data coming from um, satellites, um, as well as the data that we've been collecting on the ground with mobile sensors uh, since the month of March. I'll end there um, and again say thank you for the invitation to share a little bit about uh, the impacts um, to low income and communities of color with respect to climate change and a little bit about um, what is happening in the research space, especially um, research that is engaged with communities um, to address some of these issues. Thank you. And I believe um, Dr. Shafi was trying to talk earlier, but she could not be heard. So I'm hoping that we can, um, that the, the audio can uh, be worked out so that we can hear her. Dr. Shafi. Yes. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be part of this great panel. And um, I have the pleasure of knowing uh, some of you. Um, I think uh, Dr. Abenusi, my colleague uh, from Spelman, who is now Dean of uh, Florida A&M. And uh, of course, our star um, 
Dr. Osborne Jelks, and uh, also uh, a distinguished uh, uh, Carlton Warehouse. He may not remember me, but um, when I was co-teaching environmental policy and politics with June Harper, uh, he came to our class. So um, uh, this is really a great panel. And also the uh, Dr. Uh, David um, uh, Daniel Doze, who uh, his book um, I read repeatedly and I continue to, re to read it because I think it is really uh, a book that uh, stitches all these dots together and uh, make a sense that we can talk about social determinants of health. We can talk all about all of these, but without policy, uh, no change is gonna come. Uh, my task today is talk about the environmental policy and also how it relates to the uh, climate. Uh, environmental policy in the United States really before 1970 was really a uh, patchwork of local, state, and uh, federal laws and institution, and it, you see that gradual shift toward uh, uh, in 1950s toward a federal government to expand its role uh, in the environmental uh, policy. And uh, during that time, states were mostly really pre-consumed with the issues of economic development. Um, and then uh, we see that uh, there is, uh, you know, in 70s, uh, in early, uh, late 60s and 70s, we see that uh, there are landmark environmental laws that emerge. One is NEPA in 1969, to this day, it, it is the most comprehensive uh, law in the United States and also its component about, uh, you know, environmental impact statement that has really a venue for public participation in uh, articulating their voices uh, about a federally uh, funded uh, project. Um, and uh, it was one of the targets in earlier administration to got that part and other parts of the NEPA, which uh, we are, I'm not gonna talk right now, that is by a lecture by itself. Uh, so, and then we have uh, the establishment of um, 1970 of the uh, EPA under Nixon administration. At the time, um, the environmental policy was not perceived uh, to be a partisan issue because I think they realized, they, they, at least at the time, the thought, the thought was that it's a, a, a low cost and high benefit. So um, because we had Earth Day, we had a lot of commotion around um, that was building momentum for public support for environmental uh, policy. But then, um, as I said, uh, we really have uh, major environmental laws that emerged in the early 70s, like Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. Um, and uh, uh, major actors in environmental policy in the United States really are uh, the government decision makers, uh, the uh, legislative actors, administrator, judiciary, state and local um, makers, and then these are the actors within the government and also actors outside of government, like advocacy organization, experts, media, and of course, regulated industry. Uh, the policy making, environmental policy making process is really uh, consists of agenda setting, um, and uh, uh, formulating solution to the um, issue that is emerging, and making decision, and then uh, eventually, you know, it, uh, coming up with the solution and uh, and uh, choosing uh, the policy that uh, fits uh, for the uh, the best, uh, you know, promises the best solution 
to the uh, impending problem and then implementing and then subsequently evaluating and then um, uh, changing the policy. By nature, US, foreign, uh, US environmental policy is really very fragmented. And there are uh, constitutional and political features, like we can see the authority is very much dispersed between three branches of um, uh, federal uh, government and then also with the, uh, I mean, between the federal government and the 50 states that we have. And then also uh, we have, um, you know, the three branches of government and uh, we, uh, we have a system of uh, checks and balances. And then even within the Congress, we see that the, the really uh, the dispersal of the power between different committees in the Senate, in the House, and then eventually also um, uh, we also the disperse in the um, uh, in the uh, executive branch. In the executive branch, mm -hmm. also we see the disbursement as the authority to deal with environment uh, is dispersed between EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, Interior. Agriculture, Department of Energy, um, Transportation, Commerce, and then also uh, within certain agency like uh, you know the CEQ that uh, we hear about uh, the Council on Environmental Co Quality in the White House, and then uh, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So we can see that there are benefits to it, and then there are the the, the uh, the drawbacks to this disbursement of power, because when you have gridlock in one branch, then you can really take your issue to a different branch and hope for a different uh, outcome. So uh, you can take your issue to Congress, and then if it doesn't work because of the partisan gridlock, then you can take your issue to the court or to, to, to the local and state government. Um, but unfortunately, US um, environmental policy has uh, historically been reactive rather than proactive. And uh, uh, we, we had major crises uh, like um, rivers catching fire. Then you have uh, the um, environmental, the water policy, um, you know, uh, water policy, uh, uh, clean water policy. And then we have uh, people in Donora, uh, Pennsylvania dying from air pollution, then uh, gradually we tackle air pollution and then eventually the Clean Air Act. And uh, uh, we have Log Canal, we have, you know, Superfund Law. So it, the history of US environment policy, you can see it's reactive rather than proactive. And also most of it is really trying to be corrective rather than preventive. And, and I think uh, it has really been a problem. And most of it has been top down uh, rather than the EJ uh, uh, plan of collaboration and uh, uh, collaborating, uh, you know, uh, collaborating decision-making. Uh, so, um, okay. Um, so let me go back to the, uh, so environmental uh, policy, the first generation of the US uh, environmental policy dealt with the environmental concern like air, water, and the second generation dealt with the uh, uh, toxic chemical and hazardous waste. And the third generation really tackled issues like uh, global climate change, loss of by biodiversity. And I think that the first generation were really trying to maintain or improve um, uh, environment. Uh, and the second generation was really trying to reform. And the third was really uh, had its eye on sustainability. Coming to the climate, I think climate, everybody knows is a threat multiplier and exacerbate the existing uh, health threats and creates not only exacerbate, but also create new ones. Um, and we see the increasingly 
um, uh, the uh, frequency of the extreme weather events um, uh, like flood, heat wave, wildfire uh, that are uh, really uh, impacting uh, different communities around the, around the country. And um, we know that it's, it is global, uh, yet um, I think not as, as Dr. Jelk said, uh, we are maybe facing the same phenomenon, but we are not in the same boat. Um, and it is really, uh, climate change is not operating in silo uh, from other vulnerability. And it is, um, and un unfortunately, one of the uh, barrier has been that climate change has been very much politicized uh, more than any other uh, environmental issues. Um, and um, because the stakes are extremely high for some industries. And we see that paparazzi science has dominated the discussion. Of, uh, and under uh, the previous administration, climate change was assigned a scarlet letter. Uh, as we all know, the world had to be banished from our uh, federal government. And I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, as the world A change, it will change uh, the climate change. Uh, the, currently, the U.S. has uh, several, uh, you know, we created, we are big on reports, like we created the body of the U.S. Global Change Research Program that publishes the National Climate Assessment uh, consisting of 13 agencies, and um, uh, it, it is mandated to create those reports to give. We know that GAO issued a warning, um, um, a warning, uh, you know, the, uh, about the economic toll of the climate uh, cause disaster. And they said that it costed just in the 2018, 90 billion, 91, over $90 billion to US taxpayers. And then uh, we know that Pentagon had a report about the, um, you know, the, uh, climate change as a nat uh, as a uh, as a national security threat, but I think that uh, what we see is that the environmental policy, when it comes to climate and others, uh, th there are missing actions. Like there is no cumulative impact component, there is no uh, synergistic impact uh, consideration in climate uh, policy. Um, there is no, uh, you know, there many of these are missing. Um, so, um, what um, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I was going to talk about the good thing about the Justice 40, the executive order of President uh, Biden. This is really a very a happy time. I love his executive orders of. Uh, um, President Biden. However, um, I, I love legislation more because executive order are really vulnerable to the political uh, climate. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Shafi. As you mentioned, this is a, a great time, right? Uh, we are in the great space and uh, the great places that we are in in HBCUs where we're housed in terms of Again, advancing the uh, the needle for um, mitigating some of the health inequalities, particularly focusing on environmental injustices and promoting climate justice. And I'd be remiss, as you talked about uh, Daniel Dahl's book, The Political Determinants of Health, which we will place the link in terms of uh, accessing the book and purchasing that book by our executive director here at Satcher Health Leadership Institute. Uh, the book is phenomenal. If you do not have it, uh, we're talking about the political determinants of health book that examines the uh, policies and political influences of social and social conditions more so and uh, impacts on health outcomes, really looking at the political uh, and social drivers impacting all of us here in the United States, and we can examine it uh, throughout the world. So we really are going to advocate for you to check out the Political Determinants of Health book by Daniel Dawes. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Vereen, up to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
for that earlier introduction, and I am definitely excited to be a part of this discussion and this panel with so many uh, thought leaders that I admire, and especially some of my uh, personal heroes and sheroes in this, uh, in this uh, as well. And so with that, let me go ahead and um, get started here. Let me share screen. All right, so the talk that I am uh, sharing with everyone today or presenting is entitled uh, Exploring Water Equity and Resilience. And I am Dr. Isel Vereen, uh, Assistant Professor at Morehouse College. Um, and I wanna start just with a quick disclaimer that any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the views of any associated or affiliated organizations. Now that that's out of the way, <laughs> so the outline of this discussion just to ground everyone and uh, sort of what we're going to be discussing or what we'll be sharing today, I'm gonna to start with just some background where I'll, where I'll discuss some of foundational information as well as some contemporary challenges that have led to my own uh, sort of research interest and work that I'm currently engaged in at Morehouse. And then also we'll then conclude with some time, hopefully for question and discussion, either in this period or at the end uh, when all of our panelists uh, at the appropriate time, uh, we'll have that sort of discussion. And so I, I would like to begin sort of with this riddle and this rule says that I am tasteless, I am colorless, I'm odorless, I'm shapeless, but without me, there is no life. I am what? And the answer to this is of course, water. Yes, yay, water. I am the water person here, um, or among many water persons here, right? Um, and so when we often think of water, uh, we often think about the earth and we think about the planet and we uh, often refer to it as the blue planet because of the water that we visibly see here, um, notably the ocean, but then also our streams and lakes are really part of the most visible uh, forms of water that we, that we see. And not only do they supply the human population, animals and plants with the fresh water that we need to survive, but they are also great places, of course, for uh, people to have fun and engage in recreational activities. Um, but you might actually be surprised at how little of the Earth's water supply is stored as fresh water on these land surfaces as shown in this diagram. Uh, fresh water is actually representative of only about 3% of all of the water on Earth, and actually less than 1% of that of the Earth's fresh water is actually available for human use and consumption. So we literally, we literally, literally survive on what is essentially a drop in the bucket of Earth's total water supply. And we often also think about drinking water. And this is this wonderfully, um, this term drinking water is this wonderfully ambiguous pairing of these words being drinking and water. And that drinking can be an adjective describing, you know, the many natures of this clear, clear liquid, meaning that it's not ocean water, it's not dish water or swamp water, but we're referring to potable water, meaning water that we uh, presume is hopefully safe enough to consume without getting sick. And then also drinking can be an action, uh, uh, connotating or denoting the specific action to actually uh, drink the water and the intent to drink water. But then that leads us to thinking questions of sort of, well, when can persons drink and where can they drink? And then who gets to drink as well? Um, and so we often also may think of, well, should we feel guilty actually buying bottled water? And is our water vulnerable to terrorist attacks? And is this water actually safe to drink? Um, and as Dr. Jelks mentioned earlier, uh, there are many uh, in, uh, waterborne diseases and things that can actually contaminate the water. So we have contaminated water can actually transmit diseases such as diarrhea, cholera, uh, dysentery, typhoid, um, polio as well. And these waterborne microbial diseases that we once expected to be eliminated as public health problems, they not only remain the leading cause of death worldwide, but the spectrum of disease is actually expanding and the incidence of many of these waterborne microbial diseases that we once thought were being conquered is actually starting to increase. And the World Health Organization says that every year, more than about 3.4 million people die as a result of water-related diseases, making it, again, the leading cause of, um, of disease and death around the world. And globally, at least 2 billion people use a drinking water source that's contaminated with uh, either feces or some other contaminant. And it reminds me of this African proverb, which states that filthy water cannot be washed. So what then do we do and what does this water crisis actually look like? So this water crisis has many, many different faces and many vulnerable communities that are being impacted. Rather this be a girl in Africa walking about three miles or so or even more um, before schools to fetch water from a distant well, a teenage boy in China being afflicted with terrible skin lesions because of the village well being contaminated with arsenic or even in an impoverished slum in Angola where residents and dwellers actually have to um, have to actually fetch water or to uh, get water from 
a local river that has actually been contaminated with, with sewage. And it could also be more closer to home. We've already mentioned Flint, but it could be here uh, where a girl is getting her finger pricked for lead screening in Flint, Michigan, uh, where as many as 8,000 children under six were exposed to these unsafe levels of lead after, uh, again, the Flint water crisis. But as already been mentioned, this is not something that is um, just completely housed or only unique to Flint, Michigan. This is actually happening at a number of our communities around the U.S. And actually, the American Society of Civil Engineers, they actually issue this infrastructure report card every four years where they actually grade uh, the infrastructure of the U.S. And as you can see here, this data goes back to about 1988. And most recently, um, as you can see, our overall GPA um, from this, the most recent report card uh, recently released earlier this year in 2021, uh, it was the first time in actually 20 years where our infrastructure GPA has actually gone up and it's at a C minus. So it's still not great, but we were at a D um, and now we're at a C minus at a C minus at this point. So that is good news in that it's an indication that we're headed in the right direction, but there's still a lot of work that remains to be done. And for persons like me that sort of focus on uh, infrastructure more related to drinking water and the drinking water distribution system, uh, the US has more than 2.2 million miles of, of actual pipe that, um, that lays the foundation for our drinking water, um, getting drinking water, delivering it to various communities across the US. But our drinking water infrastructure is actually aging and is definitely underfunded. Uh, and again, more recently, this is like our overall GPA with infrastructure. We've now seen an increase uh, within the past 20 years or so where the drinking water infrastructure grade has actually gone up also. And it is also a C minus. This is largely owing to that water utilities are improving their resilience by developing and updating risk assessments and emergency response plans, as well as deploying innovative smart water technologies like sensors and smart water quality monitoring in uh, various communities and, and um, in actual distribution systems networks. Uh, but this leads us to then think about, well, what about the equity of this? And this term equity actually refers to this just and fair inclusion. And the US Water Alliance states that water equity occurs when all communities, not just some communities, but all communities have access to safe, clean, affordable drinking water and wastewater services. They share in the economic and social environmental benefits of water systems, and they're resilient in the face of floods, drought, and other climate risks. And so my particular research interests lie in these three areas uh, where I'm director at Morales of the Marine Research Institute. We focus on water research, microbial ecology, and science teaching. And I'll focus a bit more about the water research, um, some of the microbial ecology stuff, and then also my uh, science teaching um, efforts and my interest in science teaching and education or STEM education and STEM success. So as I already mentioned, I was recently awarded this National Science Foundation Research Initiation Award. And uh, the focus here is that, you know, an urban expansion is increasing rapidly on a global scale, which is altering the natural sources of microbial biodiversity. Uh, stream soils and native plants are being replaced by pavement and managed yards. So what this means is that this altering of these natural sources of microbial biodiversity. Uh, so the presence of microbial pollutants in these urban watersheds actually warrants um, I feel a comprehensive microbiological characterization of these water bodies in order for us to better understand how microbial communities persist and how they change within these uh, urban watersheds. So I'm actually conducting this locally here in Atlanta in the Proctor Creek watershed. Uh, Proctor Creek is a watershed that has been plagued historically with pollution, erosion, and high bacterial levels from regular stormwater flooding and sewage overflows. In particular, excuse me, in particular, um, because of a lot of uh, illegal dumping and what have you that's happened in this watershed, as well as combined and sanitary sewer overflows. There have been a number of groups and some federal agencies who have been also doing work in Proctor Creek and, and monitoring the Proctor Creek watershed. And so the sites that I actually chose for this study uh, have been historically monitored by the EPA. And so there are 15 sites that have been identified uh, by EPA in Proctor Creek, and I actually narrowed that down to five sample sites that I'm focusing on and including a site in the Panola Mountain State Park as a control area. And so to sort of reemphasize this fact that, you know, there is, there's still some issues or challenges that we see in Proctor Creek. Uh, although there are a number of citizen science groups and community groups like Wawa that's already been mentioned, the Proctor Creek uh, Stewardship Council and the Chattahoochee River Keeper who are starting to mitigate some of these issues and challenges on a stream monitoring uh, windshield survey that one of my research trainings that I conducted this was some of um, his response so or viewing of this. The water has kind of like a different odor. I'm not really sure what that is uh, right in front of me, but you can like see there's metal parts of stuff kind of like in that area. And uh, 
still more trash, a lot of metal, plastic. So yeah, this is definitely like a no-go. People are dumping stuff in here like crazy. All right, so what we see is this illegal dumping is continuing to occur. Uh, and so our project is actually starting to monitor this again for the, uh, to look at the microbial communities and working with uh, some of these community partners as well uh, with this. So we have our, this is sort of like a, a illustration of our uh, methodology uh, showing, you know, some of the sites where we're sampling or collecting water from collaboration again with colleagues also at Georgia Tech. Uh, we're not just monitoring for the microbes, we're also monitoring for uh, nutrients as well. And then I've shown here some of our metagenomic processing or preparation for the metagenomic uh, part of this study. And we were just getting ready to get started with all of this uh, in earnest when of course COVID occurred, right? And so the world, as we know, it sort of shut down. And so we had to put a pause on this project for a while, but we then pivoted somewhat. And so it was a good thing in this pivot where we were able to focus on a lot more of the social justice uh, things and some metadata analysis. So I uh, started meeting virtually with my scholars and working more on some of the, you know, uh, data that we could find that was readily available and publicly available data. And so scholars have been working on some uh, environmental justice projects. Uh, I have a group of scholars, uh, Jabari Lottie, as well as Lila and Joya, who is a Spelmanite who have studied. Um, their studies focused on environmental inequality, identifying sewage bills and potential inequalities by social economic status um, in, in Atlanta. And they focused on median home value as well as household income level to see how they, how that impacted where um, these sewage spills uh, were actually occurring. Um, and we actually did see uh, that there were some differences in, in these areas across Atlanta where uh, sewage spills were more readily occurred. But contrary to our hypothesis where we felt that this would occur, or we see more of these sewage spills in areas where there were um, more impoverished areas or lower household income levels, we actually did not see that. And we actually saw that in some areas where they actually had the, the highest income level, that's where we saw um, the largest sewage spill actually occurred in uh, even uh, greater frequency. So that's some work that we're going to continue sort of exploring a bit more. And additionally, I have this also this interest in redlining health and environmental science. I want to credit uh, the faculty mentoring network that I became involved with this past uh, semester. Um, credit to Dr. Tamara Basham and Dr. Pat Marcella um, for, for sort of uh, leading and mentoring in this network. And it's focused on social justice and community change and uh, uh, developing uh, cures or course-based undergraduate research experiences for scholars. And so I was able to develop a module for my class. And so one might say, well, why do you wanna study this? So under, for me, understanding how environmental conditions are informed by legacy land use practices only helps us better focus and refine our policy development and implementation to ensure equitable access to clean air, water, and land. And if you'll permit me to read also verbatim my acknowledgement statement, that there are many examples, of course, of government-endorsed structural racism, such as the disposition of the native lands of indigenous people that gave rise to what is now known as the United States and its economic power rooted in the forced migration and enslavement of people, largely of African descent and of the African diaspora. So this project was actually designed to explore the connection between the racist land use practice and systemic racism of the 1930s and the persistence of environmental injustice. And so as a place, what I used here in developing this module was Atlanta. So I sort of named my project Environmental Justice with Data Analytics and Visualization with a play on the misspelling of environmental with ATL. But this is work that can also be done wherever uh, instructors or, or students might find themselves. Uh, we just use Atlanta or I use Atlanta as a place for this work. Um, and so uh, to briefly give a brief history of, of redlining, it was a process in which the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, federal agency gave neighborhoods ratings uh, to guide investment in neighborhoods in over 200 cities across the U.S., including Georgia. They were assessed using criteria first established, again, by the HLC or the Homeowners Loan uh, Corporation. And this policy was named because of the red or hazardous neighborhoods that were deemed the riskiest. And this practice actually included both race and environmental factors as criteria in assessing the perceived credit worthiness of these neighborhoods. And it's led to some pervasive environmental as well as economic challenges that have persisted uh, even when those practices were discontinued. So the rating that you see here, these green areas were deemed as the best areas, and then going uh, incrementally down uh, for still desirable in blue, yellow uh, definitely declining, and then D being hazardous. And this is a map uh, of Greater Atlanta showing that it was redlined. And here's another map. Uh, these maps were actually um, eventually made, it, made their way into the National Archives, and they were eventually actually uh, digitized uh, through the work or collaboration of scholars at Virginia Tech, John Hopkins, and the University of Maryland, and also the University of, of Richmond, so that uh, not just persons who would actually go to the National Archives could actually uh, view and see these maps, 
but that um, the general public will be able to uh, have access to these maps as well as the criteria that were used. And again, focusing on Atlanta, I wanted to just show uh, several of the areas that were uh, deemed as uh, desirable and the best areas, as well as an area that was deemed hazardous. And this area that you see uh, in green here as the best area, one of the actual selections and an excerpt from the detrimental influence for this area was that streetcar service only along Queen Street Road to Buckhead prevents difficulty of transporting Negro servants. And then in this area that's redlined, uh, my colleagues who are familiar with Atlanta will be familiar with this area. This is actually an area that's home to the Atlanta University Center Consortium of, of, of Schools. Um, and this area was redlined and that the property required in this area should be held for fair value. This is known as the best Negro area in Atlanta and contains the best type of Negro resident and the highest percentage of Negro home ownership. And it was still redlined as an area that would be potentially risky. And so again, my colleagues, both in uh, the social science area, they've actually done a lot of work in looking at how these systemic racist uh, practices have been um, have been persisted into environmental um, uh, or financial and economic uh, issues or challenges. But we've also started to look at some of the how these uh, how these um, practices have also influenced the environment themselves, and that vulnerable communities are in these uh, historically redlined areas are also subject to uh, environmental um, issues and challenges. And one work that I wanted to highlight quickly is this uh, work by Hoffman et al. in 2020, which showed that these formerly redlined neighborhoods are actually predominantly warmer today than their non-redlined neighbors in 94% of the cities that were studied. And as already mentioned by Nataki, uh, we talked about these urban heat islands. And so these vulnerable communities, especially within these urban areas in the US, are disproportionately exposed to this extreme heat and then these urban heat islands in these areas. So to put this legend or this map sort of in, in English so that we can understand it more, but so these low, low uh, aqua color areas would be in an area with an A rating that is cooler than the average. And these um, sort of burnt orange area, this darker area would actually be um, an area that was redlined or a D area that is particularly hotter than the average. And again, uh, these researchers saw that, you know, more than 94% of these cities studied actually showed these vulnerable communities were affected. And looking here at Atlanta, we see that this is also the case here in Atlanta, where here our area that was deemed the best. Uh, this area also, this area, this neighborhood in Atlanta has an average land surface temperature that is uh, minus five degrees uh, centigrade below the citywide average. This area also received a HOLC grade of A, meaning it was originally as the best, whereas here, this neighborhood in Atlanta has an average land surface temperature that is 3.7 degrees above the citywide average. And this area also received this D rating or being most hazardous. And if we do look at some of the demographic data, uh, this is 2010 data taken from the census, we see that minority population in this area was 10% and the median home value is $1.16 million. Whereas juxtaposed with this area, uh, the minority is 96%. And the median um, house value is only 219,000. Uh, so that sort of lends a, lends a framework that yes, there are these environmental challenges and uh, an interest that I have and sort of uh, building upon some of the work that these researchers have done is also looking at areas um, uh, within this within Atlanta that have again been redlined um, and have been you know um, have been subject to this redlining to look at actual uh, water quality in those areas and look at specifically the streams and also water affordability. So with the actual watersheds, I'm looking at impaired streams. I'm not showing that here on this map, uh, but what we have started to see is that some of these areas, uh, particularly here in this watershed that uh, where we have a number of areas that were redlined or deemed to be declining, we actually see with the EPA, this is an area where we have more of those streams and those locations that have been uh, deemed to be impaired. Uh, for a number of different factors. And that's work that we're gonna continue sort of exploring. And so my research interest allows for collaboration with a number of groups, as well as uh, you see my focus in trying to uh, include students in all of this work and to sort of uh, build upon the work that uh, researchers such as myself and others in this group are, are, um, are doing so that you know, we can empower this next generation of scholars to continue this work so that hopefully this will not be uh, a challenge that we just continue to have to sort of deal with as well. And so with that, I want to acknowledge and sort of close by acknowledging a funding source being the National Science Foundation, 
uh, Morehouse colleagues and scholars, Georgia Tech colleagues and scholars, scholars at the University of Georgia, uh, the AUC Data Science Initiative. Uh, thank you again to the Satcher Health Leadership Institute for providing this opportunity. And again, I want to definitely acknowledge uh, the bioscribes and scholars within the Marine Research Institute who are definitely leading the charge on this, and they are definitely going to be the next wave of thought leaders and scholars doing this work. And with that, I'll just share my contact information, and I would love to engage with everyone uh, at the appropriate time and answer any questions that might arise. Uh, thank you. Dr. Vereen, thank you. The Atlanta University Center, I mean, so engaging. <laughs> and uh, we thank you all. And uh, we will have some time, as you see, we've uh, reached time, 1.30. And for those of you that can stay with us for at least another half an hour, we'd ask for you to do that. We have two additional presentations. Uh, and so we want to make sure that everyone uh, has time to, uh, to express what is going on in their respective institutions. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, drive on down 85 and drive over to uh, the state of Alabama, Tuskegee University, where we have the distinguished uh, Dr. Crystal James. She is an accomplished attorney, educator, leader, and motivator who has only just begun to place her mark in the world. And she is a graduate of an HBCU, Clark Atlanta University, a graduate of uh, Rollins School of Public Health with her master's of of public health and a doctor, uh, a Juris Doctorate of, from University of Houston. And her license to practice law is from the state of Georgia. And this was all by the age of 26. Upon graduation, James's interest in public health and science once again intersected as she served as the first executive intern to Dr. Kenneth Olden, the director of the National Institutes of Health, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. It was during this experience that Dr. James uh, realized that the combination of her scientific, her policy, and legal training provided her an opportunity to play a significant role in the translation of scientific research into sound public health policy through the use of community-based participatory research methods and other inclusion strategies. Attorney James has over, for over 24 years, she's been practicing public health and has an extensive background in program planning and evaluation that she utilizes to enhance her roles as special assistant to the president for COVID-19, co-director of the Center for Health and Economic Equity Department head and associate professor in the Department of Graduate Public Health in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Tuskegee University. Let's welcome Attorney James. Thank you, Dr. Stanifer, and also thank you, Dr. Dahls, for the opportunity to participate with this distinguished panel this afternoon. And I bring you greetings from the Tuskegee University. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit today and change um, our focus a little bit from um, some of the basic science underpinning the environmental issues that are driving climate change today and I'll, to focus a little bit more on some of the advocacy and some of the things that we've been doing here at Tuskegee University to try to prepare our grassroots um, coalition of community partners to be better advocates in their own spaces in rural Alabama and across Black Belt counties in Alabama. And so in doing that, what we're um, endeavoring to do in partnership with Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation is redefine national security to include health security. So what does that mean actually, if my point won't work? Okay, what that means, historically national security is usually defined in the context of a military analysis of a country's goals and needs. And what we um, endeavor to do is actually to expand that understanding of national security to include the need for health security in the spaces of vulnerable populations, many that have been described by my colleagues on the panel here today. Um, the United Nations Development Program in their report back in 2003 included seven categories to human security, which include the environment, community and political st structures, as well as food scarcity, many of which, as um, indicated by earlier panelists, are part of the drivers around that make these communities so vulnerable and things that we need to do to assist them to increase their um, inclusivity in the current policy changes that we're starting to see under the new administration. So when I say health security, what am I, what does that mean? 
there's not a true definition in the United States of health security. And that's part of what we're seeking to define here at Tuskegee University in partnership with some of our national and local stakeholders. We have some language from the constitution from the World Health Organization, as well as from other peace seeking organizations that start to give us some foundation. But, and also from my legal perspective, I've looked it up on uslegal.com. This is what the definition is from that perspective of what security from a health perspective will look like. And what we do understand is that it, it aims to guarantee a minimal protection from diseases and unhealthy lifestyles. And the threats to health security are usually greater for poor people in rural areas due to malnutrition and insufficient access to health services, clean water, and other necessities. Again, many of which have already been highlighted by my colleagues, so I won't spend a lot, a lot of time here. But for our conversation today and for the context that we're trying to create at Tuskegee University, health security should be defined as the protection against threats, which includes protection of vulnerable populations against hunger, disease, and repression, poverty and, re and reduction, poverty reduction and empowerment of people to live, work, and play in safe environments. And in, in order to do that, the critical piece for us is the empowerment of people to be able to create health security for themselves in the space in which they live. So how do we do that? How, what does health equity look like in these spaces? Well, there are a lot of things that are barriers to it. And a lot of the um, things in these little air quotes you see here are things that we always hear when we start to talk about how do we help these marginalized communities to um, at, be at better advocates for themselves and also reach health equity and environmental equity. It's political, absolutely. It's never been done before. Yes, it does appear hopeless many times, but we must muster the courage to go through this door. And, and in order to do that, we have to take a real look at where we are in society today. If we're looking to get to equity, which is um, depicted in the middle here, we have to have a firm understanding of what the reality currently looks like, especially for our um, brothers and sisters in rural spaces and other vulnerable populations. And that reality is that they don't even start here, what we would consider to be equality. Many times they start at a much lower deficit because of the food deserts and because of the historical vestiges of um, discrimination and inequality that has existed in those spaces for a lot of different reasons that uh, we've also alluded to here today. But, how what we really want to focus on is how do we close the gap and we know that there one way we can close the gap is we can stop the guy in front from slowing down and not let him run so fast so the person behind can catch up but in reality we know that that's not realistic and so what we really need to do is to get the person that's lingering behind the appropriate tools so they can run a little faster and do a little better in the race and that's what we're hoping to do with a lot of the projects that we started in the um, Department of Graduate Public Health in the Center for Rural Health and Economic Equity here at Tuskegee University. The university has a leg legacy of working with community partners um, locally, nationally, as well as internationally. And we bring that information and those um, lessons learned to bear on some of the problems that we are addressing through our programming. I'll highlight one project that a, a former student worked on with us and that we're currently re-engaging as we're looking to um, help this community be able to think through some of the current environmental concerns that are in that county. I can tell you Tallapoosa County is um, a marginalized community and I use this map to point out where it is geographically as it relates to um, the other counties in the state but I also use this particular graph, to, which has the black marks, to denote all of the landfills that are currently cited in the state of Alabama. And you can see that Tallapoosa County right here at the bottom has one landfill that's bordering on three other counties. This, the population that we're talking about specifically, we were asked by a um, Tallapoosa County, which is roughly 27.46% Black or African American. And it, it has a total population of um, women that are about 52.65% of the population. 
some of the key stakeholders in the, the community that invited us to come in to assist them with their environmental health concerns is the Ashbar Smith community and their our first key stakeholder. In that community, um, of course, is in the city of Tallahassee in the, um, the county. It was settled by newly freed slaves right after the Civil War, and it's predominantly African American. So while the entire county and town is um, more, is not um, dom uh, predominantly African American, this particular community is. And also there are um, mostly low income, low income residents and landowners. So these are people who have owned their land for generations and it's mostly air property. So they're not incentivized at all to move. The second stakeholder in this analysis was um, is Stone's Throw Landfill and it is sited in Tallahassee, Alabama. It's been located in the Ashhar, I'm sorry, Ashhurst Bar community. It's about 124.5 acres of municipal um, solid waste. And it has about 5.8 acres for CND and accepts about 1,500 ton, um, tons per day from Alabama and neighboring states. It's got a, it had, it got a renewal in 2017, and that renewal is good into February 2022. We got involved with this um, particular community in 2018 because they wanted to try to have the renewal undone. But what we were able to help them to do is to actually pinpoint the adequate places for advocacy so that they could be prepared for the renewal, which is coming up in February. The landfill has capacity until 2053. And it gives services again to the state of Alabama and three counties in the state of Georgia. So the people of Tallahassee were concerned about the landfill's impact on water quality and the sanitary conditions of air quality, insects, et cetera. From our previous presenters, we all understand that these play are critical environmental insults that play an impact for climate change. They're also concerned about the aesthetics, the, vis um, the visual aesthetics, as well as the odors that are emitted from the landfill and the loss of property values over time including the reduction of wildlife in the habitat. In this community, there is um, some subsistence fishing as well as hunting to supplement the um, food supply for the communities. So the Ashbar Smith community and the Stone Throw Landfill in Tallahassee are depicted in this schematic. And you can see here where the landfill is located. And it um, the major constituents of the, uh, the heart of the community is there at the other end. But as you can see, there's a church that's less than um, a half a mile from this facility. And that is the site where we actually are doing some sampling. This is the aesthetic that was um, a part of the complaint from the landfill. From a health security perspective in Alabama, property and health um, disparities in marginalized neighborhoods remain unreported. And so they stay unacknowledged in many aspects. And so this community um, through some grassroots coalition reached out to their state partners, the State Department of Environmental Management, as well as to EPA to try to advocate for closure of this landfill. But through a policy analysis that was engaged with this community, we were able to give them the tools to help them realize that the appropriate point of advocacy was actually with their local um, commissioners, their county commissioners and their city um, officials that they actually attend church with and went to and saw on in their community at the grocery store. So the point of advocacy that they were trying to engage with really did not have the authority to renew that permit. So understanding as was mentioned from our previous panelists, the, the three levels of government that share responsibility in not only regulating, but also in um, permitting different entities that have an impact on the environment of community are very important for our communities to understand, not just our students, and also helps them in their advocacy. And as a part of the Department of Graduate Public Health, what we hope to be is to not only be a candle in the dark for those communities, but also help to light other candles in those communities so that they can then be better advocates for themselves and use the university for a resource to get some of the scientific scientific information like my, co my previous colleague talked about on the water, water quality, the, in, um, the impacts on the land by doing sand and um, 
sand sampling for them so that they will have the necessary data to actually show human health impact for the next permitting cycle. Some of the people that we collaborate with for these types of partnerships include um, WCAPS, which has helped us in the um, description of redefining health security, help redefining health national security to include health security. And it's something that I hope that our other partners will help us to amplify that message because as we talk more about the different environmental insults that all of our marginalized communities across the country are experiencing, one of the underlying problems is that there's not a true focus on the health security of our population as a priority. These are some of the references for the information I will share with you today. And this is my contact information. I know I went kind of fast because we're short on time, but I will be happy to respond to any questions at the appropriate time. This is my contact information. I'm more than happy to share any of the um, current research projects that we have going on with at the department and the, the partnerships that we're building with the Center for Rural Health and Economic Equity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. Thank you again for highlighting what is being done at Tuskegee University. And we'll continue further south on down 75 to Florida. And we have Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Victor Abenusi, who's a professor and dean at School of the Environment at FAMU in Tallahassee, Florida. Professor Abenusi is leading and advancing the energy water food nexus. <clears throat> And this is a new science enterprise to FAMU. It's to address this vexing global challenge. Dr. Abenusi believes that the Nexus approach is based on the premise that action in one sector impacts the other. Therefore, the search for solutions must simultaneously investigate all three sectors in a new science enterprise. Through this global initiative, Dr. Abenusi has successfully organized and pioneered the Energy Water Food Nexus International Summits attracting participants from Africa, Asia, and the United States. From these summits, over 500 valuable abstracts and 200 oral and plenary sessions, presentations have been received covering four areas of science enterprise, accelerated innovation, policy and decision-making, and global safe water. Through these efforts, post-summit proceedings have been published, including the first international journal, on Energy Water Food Nexus, which Professor Ibanusi serves as the editor in chief. As a scientist, Dr. Ibanusi has developed a US patent microbial system for water and wastewater remediation at contaminated sites that include radionuclides, toxic heavy metals, and volatile organic compounds. We welcome Dr. Victor Ibanusi. Dr. Abinusi, we can't hear you. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what a pleasure. This is Rene Home coming to me. I feel very, uh, uh, very so privileged to come back to join uh, this esteemed group here. Uh, when I remember what attack Dr. Jax has been doing all this time, it kind of gives me excitement. When I spoke to um, Mahesh not too long ago, it was really an excitement to me to see that all the work we've been doing for all of these years has culminated to having these empowered women. And I feel privileged that I'm still in this midst of effort. I would be remiss if now to mention uh, Dr. Shatifer, uh, also Fatima, who has been my colleague at Spelman until I went back to, fa went to FAMU. Then to my work at at the School of Environment, I serve as the Dean of the School of Environment. And one of the things that um, I've focused for all of these years is that as we do this work, we have to make sure that my talk will feature what the future is and why, why are we here? And the kinds of research that we must begin to do to make sure that we have an open science platform I relate to what Dr. Uh, Virian uh, at Moore has mentioned, what all the panelists have spoken to, but I want to challenge this panel to look into what we call an open science platform. 
this is one way to uh, invigorate our research in making sure we have much, much impact. So my talk uh, really has to do with how do we manage some of the precious natural resources that we have on planet Earth. This is energy, water, and food. These are large. Uh, these are um, uh, these are large data sets. Huge, huge data sets. How do you manage, analyze, and utilize large data sets like energy, water, food, and all these systems are related. So we call it the energy water food nexus as a new science enterprise. So uh, it's, it's, it's really a new way to look at how we might be able to make impact on empowering our communities. So the future is here and why, why are we here? We are here because nearly everybody understands the critical condition of the planet and wants to act. We're here because energy, water and food systems are fully interconnected and present some of the vexing global challenges and also creates opportunities and ways of empowering our communities to lead environmental equity action. We, had, we are here to think and learn together how we can act. That's, that's what equity stands for. And you may know that we have, at, uh, in my school of environment, we have a Center for Environmental Equity and Justice, CEJ, which, is, which was set up by a legislative act. So we receive funding from a legislative action meaning we don't have to write proposals. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this center pays uh, my faculty members. This is the major source of our salaries, as, as you can imagine, right? So we're not bothering the, the university funding for our salaries because the center, every, every legislative year, we receive our funding to pay to do things we have to do. So uh, I, I welcome, if you need resources, you know we have the resources to support your work. Uh, let me let's take a, let's take a minute and look at this now, right? If you look at this, don't tune off because in 2050, the world population uh, has been forecasted to reach up to 10 million people, right? Now that means that the most uh, uh, the population will be more will double in Africa, and we will have more people in Africa by over one and nine percent, all the other regions will grow, but Africa will be the place to go. It will be the place to go. Now, if you look at the slide on the bottom, you see the flow of highly skilled migrants to OECD country. Africa leads, leads in this area. Sub-Saharan Africa, some people like me, I grew up, I, I'm Nigerian, I grew up having to walk 10 miles every day to fetch drinking water. That's what I did every day. I have to wake up 3 a.m. in the morning, walk 10 miles every day to fetch drinking water for everybody. From hour six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, I, I keep saying I'm five nine, my height is five nine. Maybe I should have been six two maybe, because maybe carrying, carrying bucket of my water every day with my sister. And I said, when I, and I said, we're gonna change all of that. So I can relate to all the work that's been doing all of these years. I'm, now I look at my work from a very global point of view in making sure we have the most global impact. So this slide here is a unique slide to really, really study. If you don't have it, I'm sure I'll make sure you guys would have it and study through it and making sure your work aligns to the challenges that we face today. Uh, you've seen this slide, this is uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. You look at all these numbers, do not tune off. What you do, you try to align your work just so you can have greater opportunity of partnership or receiving funding. This is what you need to look at every day. Look at what life, life below water means. In my, in my school, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, Another slide to pay attention to is this. Every, every, every 10 years, there's this forecast of the 40 key emerging technologies for the future. If you, if you, were, if you are an investor, wouldn't you be looking at this slide to study what the future is 
This is what I do every day. Pay attention to this. You notice that the helm of this slide here, you have energy and the environment. You have biotechnology, advanced materials, digital. If you look inside, you will notice the other major areas of interest, artificial intelligence, bioinformatics. So what you need to do, once you have this information, what I would encourage everyone to now do is how do I align my work to the future technologies that are emerging? My, my PhD is environmental, environmental microbiology. So I do a lot of work in this arena and making sure that my work aligns here, making sure I can be relevant. Uh, the, the, the century acceleration, the last 20th century we saw so much has happened. Now, what I want us to, what, I, what my group is doing is to have a, a quantum leap to, to, to the century, and we say the future is here. So how do we now, how do we acquire large new base of generic technologies is now made available? How do we prototype them? How do we commercialize them? That's what we do. Uh, we try to, uh, so we, we use this platform called the Open Science Platform. The Open Science Platform is really how to invigorate your research, making it more, uh, trying, to, trying to transform basic research, advanced research to commercialization, having trademarks. So that's, that's the goal. So from, from basic research, we must, we in the academic arena, we have to transform our research and the way we communicate with the community in making sure that when we do communicate with them, they, we have relevance of our work that will help them change where they are. So our open science platform as in my, in, in my school, one of those is, uh, is energy water for Nexus research. Uh, what we do there is making global impacts, uh, research enterprise. I, I will speak to these skills these areas, this, uh, these five areas quickly. I know time is of an essence here. I don't want to bug you with all this. Um, so you see the, um, this is my trademark. This is a trademark from US. This is my trademark, it's a business trademark. So that anyone globally wanting to get into to this space is a business, it's been commercialized. Um, so this open size platform is making a lot of, is, 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 is generating interest globally. And I have this uh, international journal. Uh, the content editors come from Europe, Africa, United States. Uh, one of the best minds in Europe, Dr. Um, uh, Dimitri Kopakis, who is the head of innovation for the European Commission. I think what, what may have helped me in my career was that I started up as an international student, I moved on, uh, worked with United, uh, with the UNICEF, World Health Organization, Fulbright, Senior Fulbright, all of those things helped me in, stay, in, in making sure that my work plays globally. And I think it, it is paying dividends to some extent, I, I would argue. So this, is, this, this journal has uh, our content editors around the globe is making it a very uh, interesting journal to submit manuscripts. Well, let me just quickly uh, share with you our research enterprise here. It goes from the area of microbial ecosystem, biotech, coastal and marine ecosystem, biomolecular sciences, environmental biogeochemistry, environmental chemistry, environmental policy, and of course the new kids on the blog is energy water food nexus. Um, so, uh, Ultimately, our goal is to have a legacy. This is, this is, this is who I am. We have a very vibrant community, uh, a diverse student population. Uh, our PhD, we were, I think, one of the top uh, schools that offer PhDs in environmental sciences, all right? And uh, the gentleman here in the center is our president, Dr. Larry Robinson. He's actually a professor in the school, but he's also uh, our president, so we have the privilege of our president being a faculty member in my school. He's also the PI of the Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystem, funded by NOAA. We have $13 million funded 
lower grant today, $30 million. Uh, we'll be receiving funding every five years, 15, 15 million every year. So this year, Noah said we've done so much work that we now have been, we've received 30 million and we will never again submit proposals. That's how, that's how that legacy is. So we're doing a lot of work here that brings, I'm encouraging you, if you, um, and now when I finish my work, I'll share with you. Another area of work is our aquatic terrestrial ecology, right? Great, great research in this arena. We have our ecosystem, biomolecular science, ecosystem research. This is where I belong. Um, we have, we have from all the work that um, Ethel Varian shared with you guys, metagenomics, proteomics, all the omics, we do it. Subsurface contamination, bioremediation. That was what, that was the, my, my initial work with, um, uh, with, with uh, Nataki was on bioremediation, right? Wastewater reuse, industrial ecology, all of these things uh, are some of the things I'm encouraging, I'm encouraging that this is how we can empower our communities through active research that makes a lot of excitement. Of course, we have environmental biochemistry, environmental policy. We have the center, like I already shared with you. We have professors on environmental justice, environmental health and disparities. Some of you may know uh, Richard Gregg uh, right here. Uh, he's, he's not, uh, I'm sure you guys may know him. Uh, we have Dr. Owens. Uh, we have a lot going on within the environment. We, we're going to have a new center coming up. No, I'm sorry, a new PhD in sustainability science coming up soon. Um, so uh, ultimately our goal is to have exceptional student experiences. And we have the scholars in residence program, which I direct. Uh, it's mandatory research for all of our undergraduates. We go uh, marine, we are all in the field all the time. Uh, very talked about Proctor Creek. I remember when I was a Spelman, I took Spelman students, Proctor Creek, Chattahoochee River, sampling all the time. You remember that, Maisha? Yeah, uh, we were, that's, uh, we, I'm still doing that. Even as the Dean, I still take students, <laughs> I still take students out. By the way, today, uh, my friends, I've just launched a new uh, buoy at the Gulf, in, in the Gulf Coast area. This aquatic sensing buoy will monitor water quality real time, real time. So in your cell phone, you can get temperature, pH, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, ORP, uh, algae, algae bloom as chlorophyll content in real time and the data is being to our collaboratory. So we have resources that can really help your students if they to come to, my, to our school. The future is here. This is, this, is my, this is my passion. The future is here, the power of vision. This is galvanizing the, world, the, uh, uh, the global community to concentrate in focusing on natural resources that support life on planet earth. Uh, this is, we have our international summits. Uh, we have one coming up in fall uh, that covers the, uh, the major areas, science enterprise, accelerated innovation, science-based policy and decision-making, global access to safe water. Uh, I think this date will be changed to November 17. I believe uh, it's not the fourth, we, we have to make some change, but this is the summit coming up this fall. I will encourage you to, to participate. Uh, our degree programs, our PhD degree uh, in environmental science, environmental studies. Uh, we have the master's degree. Uh, we also have the BS degree. BS degree in environmental studies. Of course, uh, to get into our school, you have to have the GPAs that's, that's necessary um, to get in there. I, this is my last slide. I chose to have this slide here because this was a previous work. I started working with uh, Nataki Osborne. This, this bacterial strain here that you see the genomic sequence, this bacterium be, behaves as if it knows me. I know this bacterium so well. <laughs> I know this sequence. It's in my deep freezer. 
I isolated this strain since 1988 or 1989. I still have it. Every time I bring it out, it's like, throw me out. <laughs> and I would say, what you want to do? I'm ready to go. This is me talking with the bacterium. It's, uh, honestly, this strain be, behaves as if it knows me. And I behave, I think I'm, this is a very beautiful strain. It has almost uh, the gene uh, sequence in here. We have genes for uh, detoxification of close to 10 toxic metals in this one bacterium. Uh, so that was the pattern that I uh, should mention. But since then, we've done a little bit more. Um, but I want to just pause here because I know there may be the times up there. This is who I am. Uh, uh, how you can? I'm, I'm on social media, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course at FAMU. Is my first name, last name, at FAMU.edu. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll just pause here. Thank you again for allowing me to speak quickly as much as I can speak. <laughs> But uh, it's really a pleasure. Thank you, thank you all. It's, uh, it just, it just, uh, everyone had so much to say. There was so much being done, right? And this is just a, a testament to what is occurring at our historical uh, institutions, and also here at Morehouse School of Medicine. I just uh, be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the initiatives, as this is one, this particular uh, series that we are conducting. We are in collaborative efforts with uh, Environmental Defense Fund. We hosted an event last fall with policymakers, a representative uh, Buddy Carter, uh, Congressional Representative Buddy Carter, and Congressional uh, Representative uh, Kathy Castor from Florida to talk about what is occurring in terms of environmental injustices and what's happening in relationship to health equity. So again, uh, we want to continue these efforts. EDF saw the importance of this particular initiative and decided to provide additional funding. And we also have an upcoming book on climate change and health equity. And what does it mean to you? And so to all the uh, participants, attendees, along with the scholars, we thank you for attending today. We did run over a bit, but uh, we will entertain at least one question prior to moving forward. And uh, I did post the question and this is open to all of the panelists. The question is, how does the role of climate change mitigation and adaptation planning influence community level decision making to improve community health? The packed question, right? But I think we all, all of you addressed it in some manner. But if you'd like to elaborate and, and fully, um, you know, talk a little bit about this, at least uh, one minute uh, from each of you, if possible, to close this session. Well, one minute. Let me just say yes. this. Uh, what in response to the question, I forgot yes. when I presented that I wanted to announce that I have five slots for Spelman students who want to come to PhD oh. in my school. I also have five slots for Morehouse students. All right. To, uh, uh, five slots, meaning that they will come in with tuition waivers and assistance should be uh, being, being taken care of. And, and for, uh, for, this, for the scholar, the Young Farmers Association, uh, we do have resources to support you. I will just stop from there. So those, those 10 slots for AUC Center, if you need them, if, if you need them, please make sure you get in touch with me. That is great, including that, that again, that this talks about the testament is what uh, is occurring at HBCUs. Many people don't know what is you know, occurring uh, because sometimes we do stay in silos as I believe Dr. Waterhouse talked about, but we need to make sure that we expand our networks and begin to become integrated, not just multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary. As we talk about anthropologists, we talk about political scientists, we talk about bench scientists, and uh, we're not talking about those disciplines, but we're talking about institutions as well. So we want to make sure that we continue to galvanize those opportunities whether it be at Tuskegee, whether it be at Morehouse, FAMU, whether it be at Howard University, uh, whether it be at Grambling. So uh, again, we thank everyone. And I believe we still have a few participants on. And if uh, anyone would like to address that question, that would be great. Well, I'll take um, the first shot at it. I think okay. from our, our perspective in rural spaces, a lot of the planning and that is happening at the national level is not really being translated down to some of these smaller rural um, political 
um, decision makers. And it, it is taking us educating the community and pointing them and, and, and increasing their advocacy to actually guide that um, change at those local uh, um, political structures. So I think the messaging is not um, penetrating down far enough. It's, it's some at the state level, but when it comes to the actual places where the county has control over those environmental issues, the planning and the policy changes have not filtered down well. I think that is great, Dr. James, in terms of you talking about, I'm, I'm so glad you talked about rural health right? That is something that isn't often, you know, discussed. And uh, what I say is that in a popular lexicon of what we're, we're discussing, but we know that rural America is suffering, uh, not just in terms of racial and ethnic and identity of, of populations, but rural health inequities. That's another layer. And so we need to definitely include that in terms of the strategies and developing some of the infrastructure in terms of research, in terms of community-based initiatives and policy implementation. So thank you so much. And we are on board with that here at uh, SHLI and Morehouse School of Medicine. And we'll continue to, uh, to bring everyone together. Anyone else? I think more than uh, planning, I would focus on um, legislation because yes. that is the key because mm -hmm. it is the policy that allocate the resources it is the policy that is less likely to bend to different administration uh, because uh, with planning, with executive order, yes, we make some traction, but not really substantive and endurable um, uh, change would come. I like yes. the fact that our Congress came up with the uh, the select committee came up with the mm -hmm. uh, climate uh, report last year. It was a glimpse of hope in the midst of all these uh, disappointment of, uh, you know, uh, mixing climate change from our, the map of our federal government. So it was really nice to see the, um, the climate report that came out of US Congress for the first time. And now we keep hearing that there are hearing uh, before that select committee about different aspects of climate. And the other thing about that climate report that was really uh, great was the fact that uh, even though it wasn't enough, but it was 12 pages of the report uh, were devoted to environmental justice. And that was really watershed event. Uh, and currently we know there is a uh, legislation uh, uh, that is introduced by Chairman uh, uh, Grihawa and uh, our Representative McKitchen called the Environmental Justice for All that finally would put environmental justice uh, on the federal map in terms of legislation but we are still in the stage of, I would say, infants, uh, uh, what you call, uh, like in, uh, I would say even in Brodio, uh, we are not really there and we really need bolder uh, policy. I know that um, there is some trend of like CDC talking about racism as it, um, you know, um, an environmental, uh, at health issues. And then um, at last year, I think it was 2019, Kentucky called it an environmental uh, health hazard. So let's uh, go with more like planning and mitigation mm -hmm. to legislation and policy. That would be my uh, preference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any final comments? There were a few other questions and we will respond to those questions via the email and disseminate those answers uh, to all those participants who did register. And uh, as we will uh, continue to uh, open up some of the uh, information and ask some of the actual panelists to respond to those 
questions after this particular session. And so we just wanted to thank you all who are still here uh, after 1.30, but we wanted to just let you know that we have upcoming sessions on October 27th. And the uh, title is Climate Change, Political Action and Civic Engagement. Where we are looking to invite a uh, special guest uh, along with uh, inclusive of voter suppression and what happens when you're talking about that with climate change and, and uh, political action. And then in February 23rd, we are inviting our uh, Georgia senators to be a part of this discussion as well for community advocacy and mobilizing for environmental health equity. So again, continue to stay tuned. We thank you for being engaged. And I believe Dr. Jokes talked about, hey, we're all in the same water, but we're in separate boats, right? And so we all are in this world. We need to continue to work together, no longer in silos, because the future generations are going to be impacted. As we, as we talked about in terms of uh, children that are in the womb, those mothers, those fathers. And so we thank you again and look forward to seeing you at the next session. Have a great day.